Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Elevate Your Leadership with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. I love to have leadership discussions with people who I know will bring greater value to me and my organization. And if you listen to these discussions, these people will bring greater value to you and your organization. And today's guest is guaranteed to bring great value. I have Ross Garcia on the show, and I'm going to read briefly his bio. He's quite an accomplished man. Ross is from Alice, Texas. He graduated from Alice High School in 1984, then completed his associate's degree in diesel mechanics at Bee County College, Beesville, Texas in 1985. Ross obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in management from the University of Phoenix in 2011. In the mid 1980s, Ross worked in the offshore and marine oil field, tough field, um, and in diesel repair industry. When the oil field industry in Texas fell into depression in the mid 1980s, in the mid 1980s, Ross enlisted in the United States Navy as an engineman, meaning basically a mechanic. After his first tour of duty at Naval Station Long Beach, California, Ross attended Navy second class diver training in Coronado, California. His Navy dive career started in the turquoise waters around Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I went to second class dive school yeah. in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, yeah. so I know those turquoise <laughs> waters. Um, on board the USS Reclaimer, which is a rescue and salvage ship. Ross attended first class dive school, which is basically supervisory level diving, in 1994 and then returned to Hawaii for follow on tours of duty at subbase Pearl Harbor and mobile diving and salvage unit one. After spending seven years in Hawaii, he reported to the Deep Submergence Unit at Naval Air Station Coronado, California. Ross was stationed at Consolidators, Consolidated Divers Unit when he was assigned a temporarily, temporary duty to Panama City, Florida, where he qualified as a Navy Master Diver in 2002. I still got a little ways to go on this bio, but folks, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what a Navy Master, what a Navy master Diver is and what a Navy master diver does. During his 26 year career, he conducted salvage harbor clearance and underwater repairs to Navy ships and submarines in the Mediterranean Sea, Persian Gulf and other oceans around the world. He was the command master chief and master diver at mobile diving and salvage unit two. So mobile diving and salvage unit one, Hawaii, West Coast, mobile diving and salvage unit two, Virginia Beach, East Coast. When in August, 2007, he led his specialized dive teams to recover the victims and clearing bridge debris to restore the commercial waterway following the collapse of Interstate Highway 35, the Interstate Highway 35 bridge into the Mississippi River in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. Russ's second command master chief tour was at Explosive Ordnance Disposal Expeditionary Support Unit 2, where he led an, where he led an occupationally diverse crew 250 sailors and civilian personnel that provided deploying explosive ordnance disposal, or what we say EOD, provided deploying EOD and Navy dive forces with warfighting enhancements, uh, capabilities including construction, intelligence, expeditionary communication forces, and more. Ross always enjoys bragging about America's sons and daughters in uniform, who he served with during his Navy career. You can read about the sailors, Master Chief, Master Diver Ross Garcia served with and his leadership experiences in his self-published book, View Through a Faceplate Window, Adventures of a Navy Master Diver. And if that wasn't enough, there will be a lot of discussion about your book. Welcome, Ross Garcia. 
Well, I'm glad to be here, Robert, man. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, man, I, I really enjoyed the podcast. Uh, and uh, man, you're uh, all you're doing. I really enjoy it, man. I you now we served together briefly there in Long Beach. Uh, I'm excuse me, Virginia Beach. And I sure yeah, yes, you. it's a it's a fantastic area. man. I'm glad glad to be here. Yeah, well, thanks. And I know you have your own po- your own podcast, which we'll talk about in just a second. But let's just start with U.S. Navy Master Diver. What is a U.S. Navy Master Diver and what does a U.S. Navy Master Diver do for the good of God and country? <laughs> well, you know, a, a Master Diver, a Navy Master Diver is the uh, master of all trades in the water. Uh, it's a culmination of skills, uh Rigging skills, heavy rigging, electrician, engine men, uh, a lot of skills that we have to master. Uh, in in addition to understanding how to how to dive the protocols and and uh, lead your men and women safely in and out of the water uh, to accomplish missions. So uh, a lot of experience. There's nothing nothing uh, nothing nothing greater valuable than experience uh, as a Navy master diver. That's that's what it takes to get you there, and. Uh, that's what I did. I mean, I, I learned from uh, some fantastic uh, leaders along the way. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have been in the position I am. I wouldn't be here talking to you, certainly, if, if, uh, uh, if it wasn't for uh, other master divers and other chief petty officers and other, other leaders from all branches of service, uh, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah, right. well, it goes full circle because same thing. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't have that incredible <laughs> leadership uh, guiding me along the way. Um, you know, providing leadership and mentorship and sometimes a kick in the ass. Uh, some, <laughs> sometimes uh, they just pick you up and dust you off, you know, yeah, and say, okay, go right. try again. That's you know, right. just yeah. rock solid leadership. And, and, um, and, and, you know, one of my motivations for writing and having podcasts like this is because that leadership, I think, is really needed in the private sector. And the yeah. more we can expose high level of trust, it's okay to uh, to fail, you know, uh, that's right. Because we pick each other up, we help each other out. And if necessary, we call each other out. Uh, and, and, and that's what leading is all about in my opinion. Right. So, okay. Right. So Navy master divers, uh, supervise diving and other waterborne operations, rescue and salvage around the world in an unlimited capacity, meaning you are the Navy's subject matter expert the commanding officer's principal advisor on all things uh, diving, rescue, salvage, et cetera. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, what an incredible, what an incredible undertaking. And do you know at any given time, how many master divers are on active duty? You know, during my time, and uh, I want to say it's pretty close. I would say between 90 and 100, 120, maybe. Okay. You know, I, so since I've been out of the Navy, I don't know if that, uh, if that community has grown, but uh uh, certainly, it was a small percentage of the total diving forces at, at my time, uh, during my time, which was about 900, 900 Navy divers. So uh, a little okay. less than 10% for sure uh, were Navy divers, uh, were ma- Navy master divers. If you qualify. Yeah, okay. All right. So uh, through, through your, your journey, and we kind of read, uh, read about it a little bit in your mm-hmm. bio, you went to second class dive school, what we call two Charlie uh, you went to first class dive school, uh, what we call one Charlie, and then you went to master diver evaluations in Panama City. What are master diver evaluations? Well, the, the uh, evaluation is uh, it's an evaluation of other master divers from other master divers. So of your peers, uh, uh, leaders that you've been around for all your career, they converge on one spot in Panama City, Florida to evaluate your ability to uh, exercise and, 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 uh, put into execution emergency action plans. It's not a school. It's just an evaluation of your peers to see if you've, you've got what it takes to stand there and, uh, put on a show, not, not just a show, but to really demonstrate your ability to, imp- uh, impose emergency procedures. And they impose scenarios on you, real life, real world scenarios on you to see if you can recover everybody safely. You know, uh, uh, sometimes there's different outcomes, uh, you know, the, uh, the process, there's, there's uh, some subjectivity to it and it has to be that way because you, you know, you just can't, uh, you just can't put, uh, uh, uh friends and, and people you've, you've, uh, served with, uh, so you've got to look the part, you got to look like the leader when you stand there and you got to look like, you know what you're doing. 
so that's the subjectivity part, you know, so that's uh, from different views of, of uh, other master divers who are watching you. So you've got to do that to be convincing, you know, so uh, certainly when they, you know, when the friends are who are, who are there evaluating you, they, uh, uh, they put that friendship aside because they know that they've got to do the right thing for the community. So the subject subjectivity portion comes from their own experiences of having to recover in emergency procedures. So, uh, and they're all different. Everybody has different experiences and they, they just kind of, they look at you, you know, and uh, they want to know if you're following the right procedure in, in accordance with the dive manual. Sometimes there's some gray areas, but you just got to pick the right thing to do to benefit the sailors that you lead underwater and make sure they come home safe, man. So, uh, so there's uh, a, there's a high degree of technical proficiency when it comes to all the nuance of deep sea diving, mixed gas diving, decompression right. scenarios, treating decompression sickness, surface decompression, that's, that's all right. this stuff. That, that's uh, right. That's imposing the emergency procedures part. Uh, somebody has a central nervous oxygen toxicity in the water while they're breathing uh, uh, high levels of or low levels of oxygen in the water, depending on where you are in the, in the water column. You may experience a, a uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity hits because of the high partial pressures of oxygen. So you got to implement uh, uh, casualty controls up to end shift, uh, shift to air, you know, and the, it's, it's those things, but you, it's, it's all about listening. Yeah. To what's yeah. really going on and then, then responding, you know, that's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that. that's, and that's the leadership aspect. So, right. so you have to have all that technical stuff, you know, uh, right. at, at your fingertips ready to implement but right. then you, you have to lead in a way that uh, you can recall that technical information. Right. And um, and yeah. and you have to have the confidence of everybody who's on that dive station. That's right. right. So, it's it's one thing to ingrain, ingrain in your mind and memorize all those emergency procedures. But it's a different thing. Uh, nothing. Nothing replaces experience. It's a totally different, uh, different element when you're trying to bring that memorization uh, to right here. Yeah, and, right. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, make sure you impose the right emergency procedure. So it's one thing to memorize it, but it's another thing to apply it. Yeah, you know, yeah. So for the listeners who are who are not watching yeah. the video, when he says, get it from your brain to right here, he was pointing to his mouth. Yeah. So you right got to get it from yeah. brain to mouth. <laughs> yeah, communication, Con listening and properly communicating. That was uh, that was the hardest part, you know, you, you know, and uh, just uh, just to try to uh, try to demonstrate what you had memorized that was the that was the most difficult part about uh uh the navy master diary evaluation process you know uh, yeah okay you know. all right so you served for 26 years which is exactly um the number of years that i served so yeah. uh yeah. so i guess i guess we're both quitters we didn't do 30. <laughs> <laughs> well you know I, I hear that all the time but uh you know there comes a point in, in your career where you know you you know, what do you want to do? You've, you you know, you've been so operational for quite a while and you miss your family, you miss, miss home. So, you know what, that's just, just the way it turned out for me, man. I just uh, kind of missed. Oh yeah. Home. Yeah. No, me too. Yeah. And believe me, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with completing 26, you know, <laughs> anything over 20, yeah. every single day over 20 is a gift yeah. to the government as far as I'm concerned. That's right. So that's right. Yeah. But, uh, but, but my 26 years were, it was an incredible career. I just, you know, started out as a Navy diver, U.S. Navy deep sea diver, went to second class school in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in 85, yeah. first class school in Panama City in 87. Um, then I discovered this thing called EOD and, uh, you know, a bit of a bit of a career change. So but um, just an incredible career along the way. All right. Um, you somehow decided to author a book. And for the folks that are uh, watching the video, I'm going to throw up um, a graphic of the book, View Through a Faceplate Window, Adventures of a Navy Master Diver. Uh, so real quick on the graphic. Uh, again, for those of you who are watching, you see a yellow dive helmet on a diver wearing a blue uh, diving ensemble. That's what we call the Mark 12. And just wondering why you chose that artwork for your cover. Well, you know, if you see the bubbles coming out of that Mark 12, it's kind of behind the wording. You'll it looks like a Mark 5, those bubbles coming ah, out. Ah, gotcha. And uh that that drawing, by the way, was was uh painted by a good friend of mine. I worked for him. He was when he was an executive officer 
officer at uh, Consolidated Divers, Mr. Rick Armstrong. He was a he was a W five at the time. Um, he made that cover for me, that painting that I just put the letters on. But uh, that Mark twelve, I, you know, that's the that's the helmet that I learned uh, how to dive in. I right. You know, I, I've only been in the Mark five as a as a just to say that I did that. I, I never yeah, worked. Yeah, yeah. And again, for the folks at home, the Mark V is the predecessor. It's what you think of when you think of Navy salvage diving. It's the big brass helmet with the right. big brass breastplate right. and uh, big brass shoes that weigh, I think, 40 pounds each or 30 pounds each. Yeah, that's right, 40, 40 pounds. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so, so that's kind of, that's what Ross <laughs> is talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so that's, I chose that helmet because that's what I learned to dive in. I made my first deep sea dive right off the uh, uh, the point there in Point Loma, California, and uh, and you know what? Uh, looking out looking out of that faceplate window, and I put that helmet on, and uh, for the first time in my young adult life, you know it, it's kind of uh, I mean, well, you know the deal. You you put something on, you get underwater for the first time, and you. And you start to wonder, man, what, what am I doing here, man? I, you know, I, I, I did push up hundreds of push ups every day. People beat me down and flutter kick swim. I was hot and tired doing sugar cookies all up and down the beach. And uh, so sugar cookies are when you're yeah. hot, sweaty, and tired, then your instructors <laughs> make you roll around in the sand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you put that helmet on and you wonder, man, what am I doing here? And, and you look out that face plate window and, and uh, you see the sea life and then, uh, you'll never forget that first moment when you looked out out that uh, out that face plate, and uh, not only in your first dive, but uh, the successions of of missions you had to go on and dive, and you wonder, man, what am I doing out here? But you see your friends diving with you, and and uh, so so things kind of uh, things kind of come to you a little bit different in life when you experience these. Uh, uh, I don't want to say dangerous situations, but there are ha certainly hazardous when you went down down and dove. It's not people aren't supposed to be in that environment. So you're kind of cautious about what you're doing. So you begin to imagine and see things come uh, into light in your life. And that's that's where I get the the title view through a faceplate window through my faceplate window. These uh, things that I write about in my book are about how I saw them uh, going through my career to not only in just uh, the missions that I conducted but some of the social changes and challenges that the sailors around me had to, had to endure, you know, a lot of, a lot of change during my time uh, when I started in the Navy to, to when I, to when I uh, retired, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and a lot of, a lot of changes, especially since we've retired from what I understand. Sure. Yeah. I'm still uh, in contact almost daily with a lot of the active duty folks in the special operations world. And yeah, um, there's a lot of, a lot of changes and certainly, uh, not all for, for the good. It's challenging, um, Robert. It's challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so in the book, and of course I read the book, uh, thank you for sending that to me about sure. probably six months ago, but I read it in a day because again, you know, it's that preaching to the choir thing, right? Right. Uh, I, I, I spent time on a rescue and salvage ship. So now you're going to tell your experiences and, yeah. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the USS Preserver here in Virginia Beach right. or the, what were you on the safeguard? USS Reclaimer. Or USS Reclaimer yeah. out of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, aft steering and these different compartments of the ship, they're all the same. And, and, and they're all, uh, uh, it, it's just very laborious to work uh, on, on that platform on a rescue and salvage ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the two years I spent there, uh, I, I received what the Navy calls my enlisted surface warfare specialist. So right. I, I qualified above and beyond uh, with knowledge of, of other jobs in the Navy than, than being a Navy sure. diver. But other than that, I was really happy to move on. You, 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 so I'm going to ask you to just tell a story, um, sure. either from your book or something, something <clears throat> that you've thought of since, where okay. just something that really sticks out in your Navy diving career. And I'm just going to preface it. I'm not asking you what story to tell, yeah. but you're, when you talked about La Maddalena and your time traveling around the Middle East, I just thought right. that was really, it, it was cool because I was stationed in Sicily for three years. I know Italy yeah. very well. And, but I, I just, I really enjoyed that part of your book, but please tell us like what, what's one of those memorable things that you've done? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly the, the Minnesota bridge collapse, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't get in the water one time on that. Uh, it was all the other master divers, Hank Stark, uh, David uh, Shep Hoister, 
and all the other uh, divers that are out there, they don't all the grunt work. And, and I think what I learned from that mission the most was how, uh, how horrible media could be. You know, there was, a, uh, there was a major cable news networks there. They were trying to get a hold of my divers uh, while they were diving. And, uh, you know, when, when they first got down there and we responded to that mission, we responded to that mission. Uh, uh, it was a cool job to be on. But, uh, you know, once the guys started recovering victims, they person, the personality started to change right before my eyes. And that was, uh, that was certainly an experience for me. That's something that's not in the dive manual. Psychology, you know, there's really not in the dive manual. And fortunately, I was surrounded by some good local people, mainly a, a, a fireman uh, who was a chaplain. And I regret that I can't remember his name. Uh, but uh, he was the uh, he was the uh, uh, the caretaker when the guys started having to recover victims. I mean, it's a life changing experience. You know, we never get closer to uh, to the threshold of passing into the afterlife until we have to handle, you know, dead loved ones. And uh, I remember on the very last uh, victory, uh, excuse me, the victim that we had to recover, Mister, uh, we called him Bobcat Bob. And uh, because he was the last victim, he was he was he was operating a bobcat, a, a mini, uh, kind of a mini bulldozer. And uh, well, he, the bridge collapsed under him. He was the last victim. We didn't even know he was under there. Uh, still, I mean, we don't know if he washed down a river, but uh, I remember his uh, his folks. Uh, I think I remember it was his mother and his and uh, uh, his sister. Um, we, we had gone hours searching for Mr. Mr. What, what we, what I call him, Bobcat Bob. And that's how we knew him. And, uh, they came down on dive station and they said, look, he, we know he's down there. He, he calls us every day. And, uh, the guys were just deflated and, uh, they came down there. They started crying in front of us and it, it, it really re-inspired the guys to get the back down there under that dangerous debris and go look for Mr. Bobcat Bob. So, uh, we were out of the water. And because uh, there was nothing else to move, the guys had uh, successfully cleared, cleared that portion of the harbor. And uh, we just decided to use the bucket crane and start uh, to start pulling up debris from the bottom. Mr. Bobcat Bob floated on the surface. And uh, man, I'll tell you, for the guys down there, it was it was really joyous. They felt victorious, even though it was in a really a great situation. But uh, they felt uh, they felt good inside that they recovered a, a, the last victim, known victim, and uh, we we gave closure to the to the to the mother and the sister. That was certainly a a fantastic feeling uh, to see the guys reward themselves with mission accomplished. You know, and that bad experience and their transformations. Uh, that was certainly a great experience, uh, and and I think just being overseas. Uh, you know, one of the things that I tell folks to tell their children is you need to get away from home. And uh, you begin to build up uh, uh, your miss, your miss of home, miss of family. And I think uh, and I think when we immerse ourselves in other cultures around the world, you begin to miss your own hometown, your own home state, your home country, certainly. And all the great things that we have here in the United States of America. And uh, it helps you go through those thresholds in life to help you deal with life, uh, to see how other people live in other countries. And uh, and uh, I lived in in uh, in Palau, I mean Palau, Italy. That's a, that's a on an island off the coast of uh, the west coast of Italy. And uh, life was like living in, in the 1940s there. Our commissary was was about as uh, about as big as a 3,000 foot square house. It was very small. But when you get out into the culture, you see how simple people live. And uh, for the guys around me, the Navy divers who I led, it was certainly a life experience. And they really understood, man, you know what? I miss home. This is beautiful. It's beautiful being out here. But, uh, you know, it, it just makes you that more, much more proud to, to, to go back to a country that you were raised in and enjoy the freedoms that we have, that we still have, you know. And uh, so... And just meeting everybody in, on the, on the missions, I and I tell you, uh, in my experiences, you know, we aspire to be master divers. You know, for those of us who want to lead the ultimate dives, you know. But uh, a lot of things in the dive manual that uh, <laughs> that I missed, you know, that that aren't in the dive manual that I missed out on. I I recall uh, 
I, I took over for uh, Master Chief, uh, Master Diver, Mark Lee, big guy. I mean, six foot five, tall, bulletproof, man. I looked up to that guy and, and uh, he had, a, he had a, a good successful tour and I took over and- uh, Mark and I went it, through Chief's initiation together. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Panama City. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, uh, you know, the war started and uh, man, I tell you what, my brother's at EOD right, right around the corner from me. Man, I tell you, it was really tough to watch those guys deploy over and over and over, man. It was really tough, Robert. And I, I thought to myself, well, you know, what could we do, CO and I? Uh, I'd, I'd worked for uh, Commander Schultz at the time, uh, Captain Schultz when he retired. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, I really learned a lot from the EOD forces and the guys, especially uh, Captain Schultz. Uh, and another guy, Mr. Sal Salvador Ten Dentu. Yeah, you know, Sal was a classmate of mine. Oh man, Sal is a great guy. But him and Captain Schultz and uh, uh, doggone Tebow Jones. Oh yeah, yeah. Tebow yeah. and I play golf every week. <laughs> yeah, man, man you gotta come you. to you gotta come visit over here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, they didn't teach me about manning, minimum manning activity, the manning levels, and and uh, here I was, a new command master chief, because you know, because nobody wanted to take the job. And, uh, and then I'd go at one or two quarters, a few months and, you know, people would, would uh, transfer out of mobile diving and salvage unit too. And I wasn't getting replacements. That's because other commands with, within the Navy expeditionary combat enterprise were taking billets from me because somebody else were, was going to meetings and I wasn't, you know, yeah. I didn't know, you know, and, and yeah. uh, I think Sal, Sal Dentu for, he, he, I don't know if he remembers that phone call I had with him, and, but he said, oh, you need to go to this meeting. And uh, so I did. And uh, man, all those things that weren't in the dive manual about uh, managing, yeah. I learned it the hard way, man. I learned it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, our, our leadership training and development um, in, in, in our era, um, yeah. I, a lot of it is OJT, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are rock solid principles of leadership and it's not just, you know, it, it, you, you, when you talk about manpower, you're talking about the technical aspects, aspects of leadership. And if you're not right. in the room, you don't have a voice, right? right. And, and we don't even know that. Um, or, or in your case, you didn't even know that. But those, those and, and I, I will say in the private sector, it's the same thing. You got to get out and about. You yeah. have to, um, uh, I'm very active with the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm very active with city council. If you want to know what's going on in your business community or in your city, and if you want to have influence, you know, you have to get out in those circles. And, and right. so, you know, I think what you're saying in the military, it's, uh, it's quite similar to that. Um, we are going to take a quick break for capitalism and we will be right back. And we are back on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. We're talking to Ross Garcia, U.S. Navy Master Chief, Master Diver, retired. And uh, amongst the things Ross has done in his retirement, he, uh, are, uh, he, he authored a book and he also has a podcast. Uh, so we talked about the book and um, is the book available on Amazon? The book is, is available on Amazon. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, one last thing about that book is... Uh, uh, I revise that book uh, about every couple of years. We have a master diver union every couple of years. The COVID kind of kind of interrupted a little bit, but uh, I, I I add in folks that I served with, people I served with at the end of the book. So I revise that every every couple of years. So uh, okay, yeah. all right, super cool. Just more more come to memory. Well, you know, it's it's more about uh, uh, having the ability to remember us uh, a couple of hundred years from now. So. The yeah. people who I served with, I remember serving with, and who want to be inside the books. That way, when somebody says, uh, who is this guy? Well, they can read about him 200 years from now. It's, oh, yeah, I served. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> That's so, cool. And people yeah, want to legacy. be remembered, too. Yeah. People want to that be is super cool, leaving a legacy. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, of course, you know Rick Batua, I take it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Has he been on your podcast? No, no, he's not. Uh, you know, he lives, he lives overseas. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, I, I, I know he's, he's a man, he's uh, got an incredible story about uh, living yeah. through a shark attack, you know, and uh, 
And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for his follow on book to tell us about how he went after that shark and ate him alive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's just yeah. kind of, that's just the kind of guy Rick is. So, uh, yeah, but he did write a book. So he wrote a yeah. book called breathe. Right. And, um, and similar to your book, a lot of his upbringing in his military career, but ultimately the book starts and ends uh, with a shark attack. And I won't, I won't say any more than that, but it's a miraculous story and it's very well told in, in right. Rick's book. So, um, okay. So we talked about your book, your podcast, how and why did you start the podcast? Well, for the, for the same reason why I wrote the book, you know, uh, you know, throughout my career, I, man, I see these stories about Navy SEALs, you know, all this, all this, people sometimes mistake me for a Navy SEAL. I had to explain, wait a minute, no, I'm, I'm a Navy diver, you know, I'm, right. I'm a Navy master diver. You know, these guys are EOD techs. They blow, blow stuff up. You know, we, we fix things. You guys, you SEALs, you go seek out and destroy and you get all the movies. So uh, <laughs> that was part of it. But uh, you know, the, the, the podcast, uh, uh, it, it helps me support another project that I that I enjoy doing. It's called the Veterans History Project through the Library of Congress. So if you go to my website, a Navy Master Divers Adventure, I've got a little advertisement in there. It's kind of big, out of kind of a disproportionate because I'm not any good at at uh, at uh, web page making or anything like that. But uh, you know, so Did right I teach now, teach you I'm, that in Master Diver School. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't in the dive manual either. <laughs> it wasn't in the dive manual exactly. It wasn't in the dive manual. So. Uh, so, uh, uh, so my podcasts are, are, uh, I have, I have folks on who I served with, who, uh, who I certainly learned from, you know, leadership, you know, part of leadership to me was just learning from people and just hearing mm -hmm. and listening and, and, you know, emulating what to do, what not to do. And, and, uh, so I made, I created this podcast to help me collect information so I could, I could write about it and, and have a repository where folks can go to understand what Navy divers did, you know, 200 years from now, they can go, what did Navy divers do back then? Well, uh, well, we just didn't party and make movies. What we did was we, we did all this. And, you know, uh, I, I, some of these guys who I, I grew up uh, in the Navy admiring, they did some incredible, uh, incredible dives. Uh, uh, Master diver, Sam Sangre, uh, he's the guy who, who, who kept me in the Navy because uh, I was about to get out to, uh, but uh, he had he tells he tells the stories on deep sea stories of podcast about he how he dove in Vietnam mobile diving and salvage unit one in Hawaii actually started in Vietnam and the command over there was to clear the the rivers out from from the Vietnam War and I uh, had some other folks uh, Master Diver Ralph Bowdish he talked about his time and serving with Sam Sangray Master Diver Sangray and how they cleared the the rivers. Uh, boats that would get uh, that, that, would, that would run aground, they'd have to repair, uh, do some repairs with anything they could find. You know, they didn't have the engineering support from NAFC like they did now. They just had to be creative what they could get their hands on to to patch holes. And and uh, they also, believe it or not, uh, they also had to man the rails. They had to put on the armor. They had to they had to uh, learn how to shoot, move, communicate, just like. The expeditionary forces there, uh, the the mud Sioux, the mud Sioux in my time, and and the OD forces had too. You know, I, I used to get a lot of blowback about that when I was command master chief. How come you're sending the guys to learn how to shoot guns? And then, well, in order to accomplish our mission, we've got to do that skill. You know, so uh, that's all right. You know, but uh, you know, so that's what the podcast is about—to try to catch all those deep sea stories, and and then in turn. Uh, I can collect some of that and and follow the guidelines from the Veterans History Project via the Library of Congress and uh, send it in. And uh, that way I can create uh, some displays at, at uh, dive commands, at the dive school perhaps, or maybe on the NECC quarter deck or whoever will have me. Yeah, or the uh, Navy some, Museum in, yes, uh, exactly. in DC. Yeah. And, and uh, some young man who's still wondering man, what am I going to do with my life? And, and he comes across this, uh, this Q code with a picture of, uh, let's say retired warrant officer, Rick Armstrong, who's my first, uh, who's my first uh, prototype, as a matter of fact. Uh, and the, he hits that Q code and, and uh, pops up uh, is the Library of Congress with, uh, 
Warren Officer Armstrong's uh, story. And yeah. it's a very intriguing story. And, and you, you get people excited. Uh, and also, it, it leaves a lasting impression. So 200 years from now, when people want to know what Navy divers did back then, well, this is what they did. You know, and and uh, so they can they can go to the Library of Congress. I, I hope that it's enduring, and uh, and read about it. So that's uh, that's what my pod page is about. It's not just it's not just to tell everybody what I did as a Navy diver. There's a, uh, there's some follow on end states that I'm trying to achieve with that. Yeah, that's great. No, that's yeah. great. That's a stated purpose and mission like that is is spot uh, on. You know, it's it's legacy. It's it could be considered recruiting in in uh, one capacity as well. So. A lot of good stuff. I remember when, when I was in high school, I read a book called Navy Diver by uh, yeah. Joseph Sidney Karnecki yeah. and, a, uh-huh. and a, a co-author by the name of Victor Boson. Yeah. And, uh-huh. um, but it's called Navy Diver, The Incredible Undersea Adventures of a Master Diver. And, you know, here I am in high school trying to figure out what I want to do. And, and I, was a, I was already a scuba diver and diving was my life at that point. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do it for a living. And I was thinking like be a commercial diver, you know, Gulf of Mexico and all that. Sure, sure. And then I read this book and I was like, that is it. I am going to enlist in the Navy and be a Navy diver. And, right. Um, you know, one thing leads to another. And that was just an incredible experience. But I mean, I just stumbled on this book in my high school library. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, one thing, Robert, I, I had no idea what Navy divers did when I joined the Navy. I didn't know I was going to be a Navy diver. And yeah. Until I went one young man and, uh, from Belize, Honduras, and he spoke. He had that Caribbean accent, man, and he was he was ripped like a like he was carved out of a bar of soap. And man, he convinced me. You know, so <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. That's incredible, folks. If you like the discussion that you're hearing today, um, you can see the video version and hear the audio version uh, on my my YouTube channel, and that's Elevate Your Leadership. So. If you go to YouTube and search for Elevate Your Leadership, you'll come across my channel, and I ask that you like and or subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you will receive updates um, when, whenever we post something new. And again, my content is all leadership-centric, and a big part of being a leader is being able to tell a story, and a big part of being able to tell a story means you, you've lived through something that's worthy of storytelling which we all have, everybody. I don't care if you're a Navy diver or a librarian, we all live through these things that are That's worthy right. of storytelling. And what I'm trying to do with, through, through discussion with people like Ross is have them share these wonderful stories with us uh, to help us be better leaders. So once again, YouTube, elevate your leadership. Please like and subscribe. Ross, um, I, I haven't asked you, your definition of leadership or how do you describe the word and the action of leadership and leading well you know uh, you know i think it's it's uh, strange how that question over my uh, course of my work and career especially in the military has changed you know i, I remember it I used to get asked that question sure. all that all the time and and i remember specifically early on in my career somebody would regurgitate the Webster dictionary answer. And, and, uh, at that time it was good enough, you know, but, uh, you know, now there's so many curriculum in the, in college about leadership courses. And, uh, and to me now, when I get asked after going through some incredible missions and serving with some phenomenal people, you know, to, to me, leadership is a culmination of all your experiences and everything you've learned. And, uh, uh, learn through working with diverse cultures, uh, cultures. What I mean is other forces like EOD, SWIC, Ingeman, uh, in military speak. In uh, in the civilian world, you work with business owners. You learn from their experiences. That makes you just a better leader. And uh, so it's all those experiences, and in, and I think it's measured in your ability to affect space. Uh, you know, I, you know, I had to work at it. I had to work at projecting my voice to stand in my ground. You know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm a smaller person in stature. So I had to work at, at projecting my leadership presence. It's some, some folks, it just comes naturally to them. You know, they're six foot 10. They got this big, loud voice, you <laughs> yeah. know, and that's, and that's, you know, it's yeah. fine. But, uh, but behind that is all your experiences and your ability to affect and influence other people around you to be, 
successful, you know, successful is, you know, many definitions of successful, but uh, to me, it's a culmination of your experiences that you've learned throughout your lifetime, you know, through other people and, and your ability to instill that or influence the people around you to be access, to be successful. You know, that's, so, uh, you know, yeah, no, that's almost, that's almost my definition. Um, yeah. Enabling others to accomplish their objectives yeah. is kind of my simple definition, yeah. but the longer version of that is almost what you said, uh, mm -hmm. word for word. I've got to take all my experience, all my education and all my training and apply that to leading others. Right. So I, I think all three of those, I call it the, uh, I call it the leadership triad um, or the leadership trinity. I, I think that the best leaders that I've worked for had a good blend of those three factors. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and so me personally, as I try to maintain my edge and advance my ability to lead others, I'm always looking at all three of those things. Um, and, and not only for myself, but how can I provide those things for, for yes. emerging leaders, right? Yeah. How can I get them training? How can I get them education? How can I get them experience? Right. And I'll tell you this, Robert, because uh, I've done some, some leadership speaking as well, as well as, go, as going to organizations and who are troubled. And they ask, hey, man, can you come take a look at my organization? You know? <laughs> yeah. And the first thing I ask them is, what's your definition of leadership leading this thing? And they almost always answer their own question uh, to resolve the issues that are, that are wrong with their own organization. You know, they always figure it out in the first 10 minutes, you know, and then, and then it's just, Hey, and then, well, then empower yourself to clean house, you know, to, you yeah, know, this, this is your, you know, your lead, this thing, grab it and, and, <laughs> and do your own answer that you just came up with, you know? And, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. You know, I always say leadership is not complex, right? Yeah. It's not like algebra or, you know, quantitative physics, yeah. um, but it's not easy. You know, because yeah. you have to do things that make you uncomfortable, or you have to say and do things that might might make others uncomfortable. That, that's, but, that's spot on, and I and I uh, that's I think that's one of the hardest lessons I had to learn when I assumed that command first command master chief role. Uh, you know, uh, holding holding the standard, holding the standard is the toughest thing to do. You know, yeah. when, when you're not used to being the guy who has to say, look, you're not holding the standard, you know, but yeah. once things start being the more success you get out of that, the easier it came to me, you know, you're not holding the standard. I don't want you around here or you better improve. Yeah. Well, how do I improve? Well, this is how you improve X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. you know? So the more, the more I was able to break through that and, and be a skilled communicator, because it takes a lot of skill and communication. It's not just, it's, just, it's not just yelling and, and, no. deserting your will right uh, it's about actually knowing. it's listening more than anything yeah. else yeah it's about applying the rules and and absolutely listening to the problems applying to the rules and, and the right solutions in the right tone and the right yeah inflection in your voice to to get people to move and understand look i'm not here to i'm not here to degrade you as a human being i'm here right. to tell you that you're not you're not being a part of the solution and uh, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, you know, but you're, <laughs> you're killing everybody around us. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. And that's tough to do, you know, you, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, but it's definitely a skill. You, you just don't learn that stuff overnight. You got to, yeah. you got to, well, practice. you know, ship, shipmate self, right. In that order, right. a, a, every right. sailor's action is number one for the good of the ship. Right. Number two, for the good of your teammates. And then self-interest comes after that. And there's nothing right. wrong with self-interest as long as it's prioritized appropriately. Right. And, and I've found it's, it's the exact same thing in the private sector. You know, I mean, that's just, uh, it's the same thing in your home life. You know, yeah. you, you and, and everybody in your family should number one, do what's in the best interest of the family. Right. So, and, and I'll tell you this, Robert, I, I have to say this, man, but uh, I'll tell you what, what kills leadership is, is our electronic devices. You know, we, we forget how to speak and we, we start texting. We, yeah. we think that we're trying to replace communicating you know, electronically with the, the human voice and interaction that it takes, you know. Yeah. Well, hopefully hearing. people listen to this podcast yeah. on their device. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but, you know, that's, but not hopefully, what I mean. that's not what I mean. I just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I got you. I got you. But but people who seek out podcasts like this and others 
Right. Um, those are people who are looking to in, improve their knowledge and their, their understanding. And it's, right, it's right. commendable. It's absolutely necessary. So, um, so uh, you know, I just finished writing my book. It's at the publisher right now. Of course, the book is called Elevate Your Leadership, just like the podcast is. Nice, nice. And <clears throat> yeah, I'm really excited for this thing to come out. Um, it, it will be available on Amazon before Christmas. It's titled Elevate Your Leadership. And um, I, I just, uh, once again, I was inspired by you in some capacity when I saw you were working on your book and then you finished your book and then you sent me a copy of your book. I just thought, man, this is brilliant. And, and so many of us, I mean, you and I just had the energy or maybe the stupidity, I guess, to, to go ahead and write the book. Yeah. But there's so many of our teammates from over the years have, they could just bring such great value to the world by by doing what you did, you know, by writing a book that that talks right. about, you know, your experiences and your teammates' experiences. That's that's right, Robert. I I tell you what, I was I was inspired at when I went to the Senior Enlisted Academy. I we used to sit there at at the uh, that was in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and we'd sit there and and uh, we this general or retired four star would get on stage. He'd talk about his experiences, you know, and and I tell myself, you know what, man, people around me, man, we do more cooler stuff than that, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then the, the, I can't remember her name. She was a command master chief there at the senior enlisted Academy. And, and she says, why, why doesn't, why, why do officers write more books than enlisted men? And that's, that's the idea that that's the seed. That's, that's how I conceive the idea. That's great. That's great and, that you remember that that time, yeah. that moment, that location, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, when I, I started writing it uh, about three years before, four years maybe before I retired, that's when I started right way back before 2000, 2013. I started writing stuff, you know, and then several years went by and, and I, I realized I was writing more about the people who served with me than myself, you know? The names started coming up and and uh, man, it, it just changed my whole approach. I, I started back over. I went through everything that I started and, and I made sure I made it a driving point to, to remember as many people as I could, because, uh, you know, when you, when you lead people and you're successful, you, you know, self is successful, if not just me doing it, it's everybody who helped me get there towards success. It's, you know, so I, I changed uh, my, my inspiration, my, um, your motivation, I mean, everything. Yeah, yeah. Everything changed when I thought about that. Hey, look at this. You know, yeah. I started calling America's sons and daughters, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. You know. No, that's, that's a, well, that's a whole nother, you know, you could write a book called America's sons and daughters, right, you know? Right. So Ross, what haven't I asked you? What's uh, what, what do you think it's important for the listeners to know? Well, you know, I think uh, as far as uh, leadership is concerned, it's, you know, I, I, one thing that I discovered about myself later on in life about leadership is, is being servant, servient to the people around me. You know, I'm, I'm here for the sales. I'm here for the people around me. I'm not here for myself. I'm here to help you, you know, and, and uh, when I think about a good friend of mine, Kyle Gilliard, um, you know, I kind of learned that from him. He, um, uh, uh, it seemed like he was in charge of everything that he stood on, man. I, I really oh, for sure. His, big, big personality, know? but, but I, but in a way that was genuine and yeah. And, yeah. He, and uh, you know what? And when you, when you, when I just recall all those memories of them, he was, he was really there to serve uh, the people around him. He, the sales would come up and, and, uh, and ask him anything. He was approachable. You know, if you, of course, if he asked a stupid question, he'd give you maybe something you wouldn't want to hear, but, uh, you know, but, you know, it was always constructive. And uh, but he was, I, I, I recall, and I learned that term servant leadership, serve the people around you, not, not self. It's just like you said, ship, shipmate than self, you know? Yeah. 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 For me, servant leadership, there's six words, or, or I can sum it up in six words. Yeah. What can I do for you? Right. You know, right. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's on a daily basis. I ask, you know, I have 40 people in my organization, six people on the management team. And almost every day um, I ask somebody that question. Yeah. What, what am I not doing for you that I should be? What can I do for you? Right. So right. Um, it's super fun. 
Ross Garcia, how can people get a hold of you if they want to get your book or learn more about you? You can go to www.thenavymasterdiversadventurenospace.com. I know it's a lot to take in, but uh, you can just search for my uh, book cover and you'll see the podcast. Mike Delta Victor, MDV Garcia at gmail.com. You can, oh. anybody can email me anytime. That's yeah, great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, and I, once again, I have uh, the cover of your book up on my screen in this Zoom format. So view through a faceplate window, Adventures of a Navy Master Diver by Ross Garcia. Ross, thank you so much for coming on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. And um, uh, hopefully I will make it to the next reunion uh, and hang out with you guys in Panama <laughs> City. If you let yeah. a lonely, a lowly little EOD guy come in. I'll and buy you the first round, man. I, man, it's great being here. Thank you for all you do, man. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. We'll see you, Ross, you. out here. Listeners, stay tuned for the next great episode. I've got some awesome guests coming up. And thank you for watching and listening to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast.